I'm Kaylee, and today I'm talking about Lynn Carter's book, Tolkien, A Look Behind the Lord of the Rings. So it's been my goal this year to read one Tolkien or C.S. Lewis related book every month. And for the month of February, that was Tolkien, A Look Behind the Lord of the Rings. So this book was written just a few years, just like 9, 10, 11 years or something after Lord of the Rings was fully published. So it's kind of interesting. It's like a little historic peek at what people thought of Lord of the Rings when it was still, you know, just new. Before it was established as the colossal modern classic that we know it as today. And apparently before the modern genre of fantasy was really defined, Lord of the Rings was sort of difficult to classify. It kind of reminded people of the epic stories of like the Greeks and the Romans, you know? And so some people were calling it like super science fiction or a giant sized fairy tale. They just didn't really know what to make of it. No wonder people say that Tolkien really defined the modern genre of fantasy the way we think of the genre of fantasy today. So much of that was defined and established by Lord of the Rings. So the author begins with a few chapters about Tolkien himself, his writing, his education, and his family, just a little of a bio short biography kind of there. So when this was published, Tolkien was still alive and hearty at the age of 76. And at the time, Tolkien was retired in a modest house near Oxford. And then come several chapters which offer a lengthy summary of the entire plot of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And it includes massive spoilers. So you really can't read this book until you've read Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So apparently the author like assumes that some of his readers will not have read Lord of the Rings. So he thinks, oh, my readers need this information in order to continue with my analysis of Lord of the Rings. And so he gives us this like, four chapters of summarizing the plot. This just seems really weird to me. Like why would a reader pick up a book about Lord of the Rings if they had not read Lord of the Rings? That's just like, that's just really silly. I mean, why would you be interested in reading a book about a book that you haven't read? Why wouldn't you just go to the actual book first and read that book before you read the book about the book? I don't know. And then I was grieved to see that the author got a couple of things wrong in his summary of Lord of the Rings. So he says that Eowyn is King Theoden's daughter when she is in fact his niece. So just little mistakes like this made me wonder, are there other little errors that the author has made in other areas that I'm just not picking up on or something? Maybe there are some other things that are incorrect elsewhere in the book as well. Then there's a chapter that discusses why Lord of the Rings is definitely not an allegory or a satire because Tolkien despised both. But it does say that any story can be applicable if the reader so chooses. So I kind of like that. We know that Tolkien did not like allegory and he did not intend for his story to be allegorical or to be a satire on World War II or like whatever. But I do think that any story absolutely is applicable. And we also explore Tolkien's philosophy of sub-creation and has his belief that all mythology contains a grain of truth. So there's a whole essay that Tolkien wrote called On Fairy Stories, talking about his idea of sub-creation, how God created us, and then we have the imagination to sub-create other things. And especially his idea that um, there's a grain of truth in all mythological legends, and that in some way, all myths and all stories point back to God. They all point back to Christ. And I've always loved that Tolkien has, has that idea because you really see that in Lord of the Rings. You can see these little typifications of Christ and different themes that point back to God. So the next bit of this book is where the author proceeds to give us a lengthy history lesson of the origin of the fantasy story, going way back to the epic Greeks and Romans. Those epics with heroes and wars and quests and monsters and gods. And then the next chapter shows how the Anglo-Saxons imitated the Greeks 
in developing their ideas of epic heroes, such as Beowulf. And then from there, the medieval poets imitated their predecessors with their popular romance adventure tales of their day, but just adding more magic and wizards and ghosts. <laughs> and I found kind of an interesting little tidbit of history. The romance genre used to mean just simply an epic adventure. And the romances were called that because they were written in the romance languages. So it's kind of interesting. The our idea of romance today is totally different from what it was back in the olden times. Well, then we dive into Renaissance literature all the way through Victorian literature, where the author talks about just a few really great fantasy authors and adventure, you know, writers that kind of stand out from the crowd as redefining the genre through those eras. And then finally, we get to the modern idea of the fantasy genre, where there are only a handful of epic story writers, the immediate precursors to Tolkien. It was really interesting just to see like way back through centuries and centuries of literature, how the idea of epic fantasy and magic and adventure and how to tell those stories um, has just developed, you know, and how every era has built on what came before. Then there are several chapters detailing old Norse mythology that Tolkien got many of his ideas from, and some of his names for his characters come from Norse mythology. So the names of most of the dwarves from The Hobbit are from an old Scandinavian poem called, um, where is it? Velespo, which is part of the Elder Edda. Gandalf's name is also found in the same poem. So Erendale is the name of, of a, that's a Saxon name given to a star, which means splendor in Old English. And the name Orcs can be found in Beowulf. It says monsters of all sorts were born, Etons and elves and orcs worst of all, the giant folk also. And Theoden is also an old Anglo-Saxon word that means chief or ruler of a tribe, a prince or king. So literally, Theoden is king, king, king Theoden. <laughs> I thought that was interesting, just finding out about all these nifty Anglo-Saxon words and stuff. And then there are a few things in the last few chapters, kind of analyzing some of the characters. And I thought there were some really interesting insights into the personalities and sort of the function of different characters in Lord of the Rings. So the author talks about how while a heroic classic hero like Aragorn is obviously destined for greatness, Frodo, in contrast, is a humble character and he has greatness thrust upon him. The function of this contrast is that the reader really identifies with Frodo because he has humble beginnings. And he's just, he's an ordinary person. He's just ordinary. But then as he goes through his adventures and he suffers, he grows through his difficulties. He grows through his suffering. One of my favorite insights about the characters in, in these chapters, in the last chapters there, is about Sam's character. The author says that Sam is not really a comedic character. He does have some comical lines and, and different comedic scenes, but he's not a clown. There's this juxtaposition of Sam's common sense and his plain speaking manner that is contrasted against the more formal speech of the highly educated royal people who surround him. And that is what creates this humorous element is just that contrast between plain, ordinary, good old Sam and the more highly born court manners of other people around him. However, I love that Sam is taken seriously by important people. But we can also acknowledge that without meaning to, he does bring humor to the story. And it's that contrast between Sam and the extraordinary circumstances in which he finds himself. Poor Sam. He, he's really out of his element with, with some of these folks. <laughs> and yet, all the characters respect him, they admire his good qualities, they value the common sense approach that he brings to the team. I just love Sam. 
Sam really is wonderful. <laughs> so this book was published before The Silmarillion was finished. So the author has to guess about the many things they think will be included in The Silmarillion. The author guesses that Gandalf is perhaps one of the gods of the Valar. He thinks that Gandalf is perhaps not just a mere mortal. So as we now know, that was a good guess. You're right. <laughs> Overall, this is an interesting book about Lord of the Rings. It gives some really great history about literature and the fantasy genre and the myths that Tolkien drew from to create this beloved Middle Earth. I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it. So please leave me a comment down below and let me know what is a book or maybe an article that you read about Lord of the Rings that kind of gave you a special insight into the history of Lord of the Rings or the characters or, or something like that that made you kind of think about Lord of the Rings in a different way or with a deeper meaning. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and remember the right book in the right hands at the right time can change the world.